Radio. Hello, Internet viewers. I'm the Fairly Odd Gamer. Nintendo has become widely known for its video games over the years from numerous consoles, such as the NES, Super NES, and the Game Boy games. But how did Nintendo become a huge phenomenon? Well, it was all thanks to the money-making cash cow, Mario. Now, I'm pretty sure that most of you, if not all of you, are familiar with Mario in general. But just out of curiosity, let's talk about how Mario came to be. In 1981, a young man named Shigeru Miyamoto, along with the late Gunpei Yokoi, created a game called Donkey Kong in which you play as Jumpman as you climb up an obstacle course and save Pauline from the evil clutches of a giant ape called Donkey Kong. Before releasing in America, Miyamoto changed his name to Mario after his then-office landlord, Mario Sigali. Don't worry, we'll have more Sonic references. However, in 1985, Mario hit the big time with Super Mario Bros. It became a huge success and would eventually have cartoons, serials, a live-action movie, countless merchandise, and even a theme park attraction at Universal. But 11 years later, one video game would change the way a typical Mario game is made. That game is Super Mario 64, a lost out to the newly released Nintendo 64. Not only that, but the game was initially released in Japan on June 23rd, 1996, exactly five years after the debut of Sonic the Hedgehog. You heard right, there was a time where Mario and Sonic share the same birthday. Coincidence? I think not! I never grew up with the game, let alone the fact that I didn't own Nintendo 64 at the time. Even though the first Mario game I ever played was Mario Tennis, the first Mario game I ever owned was Super Mario Sunshine, which I somewhat talked about on the GameCube preview DVD. Don't worry, I'll get to this game eventually. While I do own the original N64 version, the game was later reported last year onto the all-new Super Mario 3D All-Stars for the Nintendo Switch. And that's the version I'll be looking at for this review. So does this game still hold up after 25 years? Let's find out. While on the tile screen, you can mess around with Mario's face in any way, shape, or form. It's noticed that the first music you hear is a remix of Mario's original theme, which definitely brings back nostalgia to classic Mario fans. Not only that, but this is also one of the first games to have Mario voiced by Charles Martinet, though it is noted that this is not the first Mario game he voiced in. The game starts off like this. Princess Toadstool, or Peach, invites Mario to the castle as she has made the cake for him. Mario arrives at the castle only to find out that Bowser has kidnapped Peach, whom Mario has to save. In order to do this, Mario has to retrieve power stars that not only have him explore more areas of the castle, but it's also required to defeat Bowser and ultimately save Peach. Peach's castle acts as the hub world of the game, and I think it works really well. Not only are the levels close to one another, but you can also collect secret stars within the castle whether in hidden rooms, buying 8 red coins, or as a gift from Toad. Before I move on, it's best to point out that the 3D All-Stars version is based on the 1997 Shindo version, which not only adds rumble support, but also fixes a few glitches. The only downside is that a few speedrunning techniques end up being removed entirely, the famous backward long jump glitch being one of them. Other than that, Mario's basic controls work really well. Use the analog stick to move Mario, and tilting the analog stick further can make him run faster. He can jump normally, but he can also double jump and even triple jump if you tap the jump button at the right time. In addition, he can somersault by crouching and pressing the jump button, a long jump if you crouch while running, the ability to crawl which I purposely used once, a 1-2 punch combo for close range attacks, ground pound on the enemies, lunge dive onto land, and a breakdance kick which I hardly ever use. On the other hand, it's pretty cool seeing Mario bust a move. You can also rotate the camera with the right analog stick or a button to change camera views. But try not to fall from a large height because it results in taking damage. Yep, Mario has a health meter which he can refill by collecting coins or breathing air. It's actually a pretty good concept the more I think about it. Mario has to venture through 15 worlds which Mario can transport to by jumping into a painting. Just select a mission and you're off. For the most part, you can pretty much complete any mission you want. There are a few exceptions like Race Against Koopa the Quick who won't show up unless you're in that specific mission. But other than that, you can retrieve any Power Star in no particular order. Each world contains 7 power stars for Mario to collect, which includes the 1 star in each world where you have to collect 100 coins. In addition to regular coins you find scattered around each world, there are red coins, equivalent to 2 regular coins, and blue coins which equal to 5 regular coins. These blue coins can be attained by defeating rare enemies 
or ground pound a button that allows blue coins to appear, but you only have one shot at it. If you manage to collect 100 coins, the star will appear right above Mario's head no matter where he is. So be sure to get that last coin in an area that's neither dangerous nor difficult to backtrack to. Otherwise you'll make this game more difficult on yourself. It's not till later in the game when Mario collects special cats for special abilities, which can be unlocked by ground pounding these giant switches. These power-ups include the wing cap, allowing him to glide after doing the triple jump if you know how it's handled, the vanish cap, allowing him to turn invisible for a short period of time in which he can walk through gates and certain walls, and the metal cap granting him temporary invincibility in which enemies cannot touch you and can even walk underwater if needed. Out of all the special caps, I think the metal cap is the most useful cap in the game. Eventually Metal Mario will become its own character for future games. Graphically it looks amazing in spite of the Nintendo 64's limitations. It takes just about every element from Mario's 2D games and replicated them beautifully in this game. If I were a nitpick, I think some of the models didn't really age very well. While I like seeing low poly Mario the farther away he is compared to the camera, I'm only referring to Thwomps and mostly Bowser. More on him later. With that said, let's talk about the worlds themselves. bob on Battlefield and Womp's Fortress are the first two worlds of the game, and they're both nice beginner levels that introduce Mario's gimmicks in a 3D environment. Jolly Roger Bay and Dire Dire Docks are the water levels in which Mario's health begins to deplete the longer he stays underwater. But let me tell you right now, the music for these levels are incredible and it's probably the most soothing music I've ever heard in a video game. In fact, I love the soundtrack in this game. Some of my favorite tracks include Hazy Maze Cave, the Road to Bowser stages, the slide theme, and the final boss theme among others. Cool Cold Mountain and Snowman's Land, as you may have guessed, are the ice levels in this game. These stages feature a small portion of ice physics, but they don't seem to hinder me at the slightest. Big Boo Haunt takes place in a haunted house contained with booze, and the overall level design looks pretty good in my opinion. Both Leave a Lava Land and Shifting Sand Land are self-explanatory based on the aesthetic alone, so not much to talk about. However, there is one question we all want to know. What is Shifting Sandland like? Well, let me tell you. In the words of Anakin Skywalker, It's coarse and rough and irritating. And it gets everywhere! Hazy Maze Cave is an underground cave that I think has one of the best renditions of the underground theme I've ever heard. It also has a section where you need the metal cap to run through poisonous gas or the health meter will begin to deplete. Other worlds include Wet Dry World with a city construction aesthetic and these switches that control the water level, Tall Tom Mountain in which Mario climbs up a mountain and a slide section if you jump into a wall that acts as if you're jumping into a painting, and Tiny Huge Island with these warp pipes that have Mario change sizes affecting the overall environment. The last two worlds are TikTok Clock, which takes place in a clock, and Rainbow Ride, where he hits a ride on a rainbow with a magic carpet. Before I forget, there's a total of 120 power stars to collect, but you need at least 70 to reach the final Bowser stage. Speaking of which, let's talk about the Bowser stages. Before you fight Bowser, Mario has to venture through gauntlets of obstacles and enemies, which makes me feel like I'm playing a Mario game. There's also the added challenge of collecting 8 red coins in each stage in order to collect a hidden power star. Once that's over with, the battle against Bowser begins. Yeah, Bowser does seem a bit swollen, but I'll give it a pass as there are some graphic limitations from the console. All you have to do is simply run and dive on Bowser's tail and toss him to one of these bombs and therefore defeat Bowser. As a result, you get a Bowser key that takes Mario one step closer to rescuing Peach. The final Bowser level, Bowser in the Sky, is much different from the other battles, not because of the boss music, but you have to throw Bowser at three bombs rather than one. The music used for the final battle is without a doubt my favorite track in the entire game. The use of the piano organ gives it more of a haunting quality, which I think makes it more sinister. After defeating Bowser for the final time, Mario flies back to the outside of Peach's castle as you see Peach slowly dropping on land and thanks Bowser for saving Peach. Mamma mia! Mario! The power of the stars is restored to the castle. And it's all thanks to you. Thank you, Mario. Peach makes Mario a delicious cake, and everyone lives happily ever after. The end. Hey, dude. How's it hanging? Oh, hey, Alex. What's up? Nothing much. But I see you just finished Super Mario 64. Yeah? You know, I remember playing that game when I was just a pup. That's awesome, Hux. Yeah. But I do want to ask one thing. Oh, yeah? What's that? 
You know where Luigi is in that game? Actually, that's a good question. For some reason, Luigi is nowhere to be seen in this game. However, there may be a reason as to why that is. According to an interview with Miyamoto, not only was Luigi going to be playable, but he was also going to do everything Mario could do. The only downside was that this game couldn't handle two playable characters. There were even rumors of a mini-game in which players could control Mario and Luigi, but it ended up being scrapped assuming that most players wouldn't have enough controllers. But years later, the Nintendo 64 added games that would include multiplayer support, such as Mario Kart 64, Mario Tennis, and even the original Super Smash Bros. However, it wasn't until 8 years later when a new version of the game was released, and that is Super Mario 64 DS. DS? You mean the Nintendo DS? Right you are, Hux! And believe it or not, this is actually a launch title for that very console. Oh, so like how the original game was a launch title for the N64, right? Right again, Hux. However, I won't be reviewing this game on the DS. Wait, what? In August 2016, the game would end up being part of the Wii U Virtual Console, and that's the version I'll be looking at for this review. That's awesome, gamer! Anyway, I just want to see what's up. Later, dude! <laughs> The DS version starts off the same way as the original, except Mario is now joined by Luigi and Wario, who are all invited to Peach's castle. However, after a passage of time, Yoshi finds out that they are nowhere to be seen. Yep, this game starts you off as Yoshi rather than Mario. For those who may not know, Yoshi only appears in the original if you manage to collect all 120 power stars and you're then rewarded with 100 lives and having you fly around the outside of Peach's castle. It's lame nowadays, but back then it was worth it. But anyway, Yoshi has to save not only Princess Peach, but also both Mario Brothers as well as Wario. And one of the reasons being is that Mario is the only one out of the four characters that can defeat Bowser. You heard right, you can actually play as four characters rather than one. So I wouldn't necessarily call it a reboot rather than a remake. Or something like that. Yoshi can flutter jump and can put enemies in his mouth, possibly turn them into egg missiles for a boss fight. Mario has no change from the original and is the only one that can wall jump. Similar to Yoshi, Luigi can also flower jump, but he also has a spinning jump for larger gaps, which is very useful in my opinion. And despite Wario having no athletic ability, he can use his brute strength to punch enemies as well as black boxes. But the thing is that all characters can destroy certain colored boxes depending on who you play as. One of the main differences from the N64 version is that the special abilities are not from caps, but from flowers. Yoshi can breathe fire, similar to the watermelons from Yoshi's Island. Mario can turn into a balloon and float really high, similar to the power balloon in Super Mario World. Plus, he can use the wing cap for certain levels. Luigi can turn invisible, and Wario turns into Metal Wario, which effectively replaces both the Vanish Cap and the Metal Cap from the original game. 30 more Power Stars are added along with the 120 stars from the original, which makes a grand total of 150 Power Stars to collect. It's mostly thanks to the new characters to play as, and even exclusive levels and missions where you collect 5 silver stars to unlock the power star in a small clear container. In this, the castle is filled with rabbits for the game to catch, which now unlocks more minigames as opposed to the original where you gain a star. For the most part, the minigames are a time waster, but some of them are actually quite enjoyable like having 3 Marios jump onto Shy Guys. Controlling the characters in the DS version is a bit awkward to handle, especially with Mario. Because of this, the DS version has a run button to help comprehend the fact that you can't explore as freely as the original version. At least the Wii U version lets you use an analog stick, but the accuracy is far worse than the original. It's so bad that I can't even do the wall jump accurately. Graphically, the game looks incredibly different from its counterpart, but I think the original looks better. While Bowser looks better in my opinion, the overall game looks more pixelated to me. But other than that, it's pretty much the same as the original version, so there's really nothing else to talk about. So, after 25 years of this game's existence, does this game still hold up with the other Mario games out there? Absolutely. Both games do a pretty good job of taking a video game character we all know and love, and putting it in a 3D environment. But if you were to ask me which version I like better, then it would have to be the N64 version. Don't get me wrong, I like the DS version overall, but there are some things that make me like the N64 version a bit more. On a graphical standpoint, the N64 version is clearer than the DS version despite having the capabilities of 3D graphics. 
Gameplay wise, the N64 version feels much better than the DS version in regards to overall control and accuracy, which I don't get much out of in the DS version. But there are a few things in both versions that I really enjoy. The level design is pretty good in both versions, and the hub world does its job perfectly. The other thing I like from both versions is the music. The overall soundtrack is pretty good, and each of them stand out in their own right. Overall, I think both versions of Super Mario 64 are pretty good games, but I feel like the DS version is a neuter version of the original N64 game. I do recommend playing both games, but I believe you'll have a better experience with the original version. It's surprising that I never thought the opportunity to fully talk about a Mario game until today. And it's only a matter of time before I cross down that path once again. But you know what? I'm gonna go back to talking about licensed games, and maybe... Alright, looks like I'll be talking about Spider-Man next. So which Spider-Man game will I review? You'll just have to wait and see. I'm the Fairly Odd Gamer, and I wish you all good luck the rest of your day or night, wherever you are. Take care, everyone. How's it going, dudes? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell icon if you want to get notified for upcoming videos. Also, be sure to check me out on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, as well as my character buddies on TikTok and video commissions. Links to those in the description below. Speaking of character buddies, here's one of them right now to finish out the video. Oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. Hi everybody, it's me, Dino Duck. And today, I need to thank you guys so much for watching this review. And if you want to support the channel, you can head over to Gamer's Patreon and become a supporter. With this, to the access to exclusive content, I can't wait to have supporters to find on the channel. And that's all for the game movie that's right here on the ground. And so I speak right now for one of my encounters on this channel. I hear you guys spread your style. Most of what I will send your ball. Also, oh, there is one to count. So, once more, thank you so much for watching this video and supporting the channel. I'll see you guys later. <laughs>